here's the deal. I'm going to make your life more difficult now, but you're going to be better off in the long run. That's the central idea behind desirable difficulties. Used well, desirable difficulties can make learning experiences a lot more effective. And whether you're a student or a teacher, you can take advantage of this idea. But what makes some difficulties desirable? And why? And how can we know? Stick around to find out. To understand desirable difficulties, we really need to make a distinction between training and performance. So training is the part when we're learning or studying or practicing, right? It's when we are uh, going to basketball practice or like scrimmaging against another team. Um, it's when we are doing math homework problems or you know, taking some math tests. It's when we are um, you know, building a little model building if we're an engineer to show how the building might work. Uh, those we might characterize as kind of the training or learning or studying phase. Um, performance is something a little bit different. Performance is when things really count. So, you know, performance is, hey, you're playing basketball in a tournament and, you know, it's for all the marbles. Um, it's when you're actually using mathematics in your life or your work to solve problems. It's when you are actually building a building that people are going to live in and that, you know, can't fall down um, because falling down would mean bad things. This distinction helps us see that it's, it's really the performance that really counts. If we make mistakes during training, that's, that's okay. Uh, what we don't want to do is make mistakes during the performance, and so we should judge training methods by how well they result in higher performance, not how well uh, someone seems to be doing just during the training part of things. So if you are going to surgery and your surgeon did fantastic during uh, their surgical training, but they're uh, making mistakes during the actual surgery, that's that's not good. Um, by contrast, if you have a surgeon who maybe maybe they made a lot of mistakes during the training phase, but they turned out to be a very good surgeon once they got um, uh, made those mistakes and they've improved, um, that's great. That's what we care about. In most cases, desirable difficulties mean uh, increasing mistakes during the training phase. So you increase the number of mistakes that a student or a learner is going to make during the training phase, but you decrease the number of mistakes that that same person is going to make during uh, the performance phase. So what kinds of difficulties are desirable? I want to talk about three classic cases. So case number one is spacing. So spacing or space practice involves um, spacing out your study sessions or your practice sessions over time. So instead of training for three hours or studying for three hours this afternoon, you might study for an hour this afternoon and an hour a couple days from now and an hour a few days after that. Now this usually leads to some amount of forgetfulness on the part of the student. Um, but the upside is that you're going to, say if you're studying uh, history, let's say you're going to retain more of the information that you read if you space your study, study sessions over time than if you had massed it all together in one um, single study session. Okay, so example number two. Example number two is interleaving. So interleaving involves um, kind of mixing up categories or problem types within a single training or study session. So maybe it's best to see an example of this. 
suppose you were learning um, addition problems and multiplication problems and division problems. Well, you could study those in blocks. You know, all the addition problems in one block, all the multiplication problems in the next block, and the division problems in the final block. But what interleaving uh, would do is to say, mix up those problem types together. So uh, in today's session, you might do an addition problem, and then the next problem might be a division or a multiplication problem, and then the next problem might be, you know, you, you don't even know what. Um, so what happens is that uh, this style of training or this style of practice is more difficult for students because they don't know what's coming next. Um, and so they can't just kind of sit there, I know how to add, I know how to add, I'm just going to add again, add, add, add. Um, they have to actually, oh wait, what is this? Oh, this is a different kind of problem. Oh wait, now I have to think of a different kind of way to solve this problem. The third classic example is contextual variation. And I think it's easiest to understand that with an example. So say I am throwing free throws. I, I want to practice my free throw shot. Now, I can just sit there at the free throw line and throw free throw, throw free throw, throw free throws. Um, and, you know, that's fine. But what contextual variation would recommend would would have us do is maybe move a little closer to the basket, move a little further away, move a little to the left, move a little to the right. Um, they're kind of adding in a little bit of that variation is going to make it more difficult during practice because your body has to adjust to you know a different angle on the basket or, or being a little closer, a little further away. But ultimately, that variation will help you throw the free throws when it counts. At least, that's what the research suggests. Now, there's a key word in the phrase desirable difficulties, and that is desirable. Not every difficulty is going to be beneficial in the long run. Not, not every difficulty is going to be helpful. Some difficulties are just terrible, and they're bad for everyone, and they're painful, and they just don't help at all. Um, so if I just started throwing things at you while you're trying to read something, that's going to make it more difficult for you to read, and it's not going to give you any kind of corresponding benefit. Um, if I change the font of this text so that uh, it's harder for you to read, for instance, um, that is, again, not going to help you understand what I'm saying any better. And so, how do we know what is a desirable difficulty and, 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 and what's not a desirable difficulty? How do we know what's a good difficulty and a bad difficulty? Well, the first question to ask is, is it one of the three categories I mentioned? Um, is it spacing, interleaving, or contextual variation? If it is, then uh, it's, it's, it's probably good. It's probably a good thing. Now, there are nuances in how to actually apply this in practice, right? With, with interleaving, when do you start interleaving? Um, spaced practice sessions, how long do you space the practice sessions? How long are the practice sessions with contextual variation? How much variation are you going to introduce? Um, when to start introducing variation, etc. But generally speaking, these categories are, are the kinds of difficulties that are beneficial. Okay, so if it's not one of those categories, what do you do? And here it's, it's a little tough to say for any given kind of difficulty that you might be talking about. The question I think you want to ask yourself is, does the difficulty relate to what the learner is learning? Um, or is it just there as kind of a distraction or a, a kind of busy work or is it just going to make the student kind of annoyed? Any difficulty makes the student exert more effort. The question is, where is that effort going? So in this uh, font example, um, I can change the font and the color here to make the text harder to read. Um, 
And so that's, that means that the student is going to spend more time trying to figure out what the words even are. That's effort that they're spending to try to figure out what the words are. And that's, that means that they can't exert effort. That's less effort that they're going to be exerting trying to um, think about what the words mean, right? So it's just making things more challenging for the student without any benefit. So I want to leave you with one last example, and that is baseball donuts. Sadly, not the kind of donuts that you eat. Um, baseball players, when they're practicing their swing, sometimes they put weights on uh, their bat, uh, put these giant donuts on their bat, and so then it makes the bat heavier. And the thinking is that this, uh, this will help them in their s swinging in the game. Obviously, you can't swing with a giant donut on your bat in the game, but when you put this donut on in training, it's supposed to help you swing faster in the actual game. Uh, and so, is this, is this a desirable difficulty? Well, uh, it doesn't fall into one of our categories, so we have to kind of put our thinking caps on and see why it might be and why it might not be. Why might it be a desirable difficulty? Well, it might be good because the weight makes the bat heavier, and the heavier the bat um, kind of builds the swinging muscles or what have you. And then when you take the donut off, you take the weight off, and then you swing the bat, it, you, you can swing that much faster. Um, so that's, that's why it might be. Why might it not be a desirable difficulty? So the reason why it might not be a desirable difficulty is that when you put weight on the bat, you're actually changing, potentially changing how your body responds to the bat, the way your hips and arms and legs all work together. So in principle, it might even hurt you if the weight um, ends up distorting your swing, perhaps. And so if we just think about it, it's actually, it's kind of hard to say. We don't really know which one is correct. So luckily, people have been looking into this for the past couple of decades or so, and judging from the research, it, it doesn't seem like putting a donut on your bat really helps you swing that much faster. It, it can make people feel like they're swinging faster because they've just swung a lot slower and now they're with, without the donut, the bat does indeed feel lighter. And that's the subjective feeling that you get. Um, but it doesn't, you know, when you actually measure how fast the swing is, it doesn't really seem like it helps. So this is why actually testing your training method or your teaching method is really, really important. Uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's a video for another day. Do you have a desirable difficulty in an area that you are teaching or learning? Or maybe you don't know if it's desirable or not. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, any suggestions you have for future shows, um, um, put down in the comments. Special thanks go out to Robert Bjork, who originally coined the term desirable difficulties and just contributed immensely to the research on learning over the course of his long career. As usual, references are down below for further reading. That's it for this video. See you next time.